Yellow Brick War, Chapter 30 The next morning, we assembled in the courtyard. Lulu wanted to come with us, but agreed to stay at the Woodman's Palace with her monkeys in case any of Glinda's army returned. Ozma was too much of a liability in the Emerald City, and Lulu was only too happy to, t to look after her. We were all trying to make up for a pass in one way or another, I guess. Except for Ozma, who couldn't remember hers. Suddenly, having her your memory wiped seemed more like a blessing than a, cur than a curse. So in the end, it was just Knox, Gert, Mombi, Glamora, and me who prepared to teleport to Dorothy's palace in the Emerald City. The last I'd seen it, it'd been a scary place. The city had been leveled off as it had been hit by a bomb, and the palace itself had seemed to be growing like a living thing, like it had been possessed by some kind of demonic force. It had been the wizard's doing, and he was gone now, but knowing Oz and knowing what I knew now, I thought it was unlikely that things had improved much, even without him. If there was one thing Oz had taught me, it was to prepare for the worst. So the five of us joined hands, and Mombi began to mumble the familiar words of the teleportation spell that would make, take us all there. I was an old hand at flying by now, but it still didn't lose its thrill. I felt the familiar jerk of magic lifting me up into the air, and the sensation of the bottom of my stomach dro dropping as we rose to the sky, our hands still linked. Far off on the horizon, I could see the pale stripe of the deadly desert. In the opposite direction, the tall peaks of the mountains. For just a moment, in that glorious weightless space, I could pretend that I wasn't going back into battle, just flying over the jewel-bright landscape of Oz, with the wind in my hair and the sun on my back. I could see the same joy in Knox's face. Even Mombi, who hated heights, was smiling as we hurtled toward our destination. When Knox's expression changed, I turned my head to follow his gaze and gasped out loud. We were flying into a storm. Out of nowhere, dark clouds gathered into a churning inferno before us, looming directly over the ruined Emerald City. I'd seen the changes in the city on the ground, and that had been bad enough, but from the air it was terrifying. The bombed-out buildings, the empty streets scattered with broken gems. From here I could see that there were bodies in the ruins, too, twisted and broken like the buildings around them. I swallowed hard. At the center of it all, the twisted spires of the Emerald Palace stabbed upward into the dark, oily-looking clouds. The palace seemed to radiate a tangible sense of menace. Dark, serpentine, twisted vines up, twisted up and twisted to its twisted towers, and smoke boiled out of it some of its broken windows. What had been order orderly gardens looked like a jungle, thick with thorny plants I didn't recognize. The air was filled with a deep ticking noise, like the world's biggest grandfather clock was somewhere, inside the palace. The great clock, Gert said grimly. She's already trying to use it. Hold on, Mombi yelled, her grip tightening on my hand. As we drew closer to the storm, gusts of wind began to buffet us, hard and ins insistent as fists. One blast was as strong it almost pulled me out of Mombi's grip. On my other side, Gert squeezed harder, too. The witches began to chant. Don't let go, Amy, Gert yelled over the rising wind. She didn't have to tell me twice. I held on for dear life as Gert and Mombi's chanting rose in strength to meet the force of the storm. We were almost on top of the palace now. Suddenly I can make out a teeming mass of figures in the overgrow, and tangled gardens surrounded the palace. There's still an army there, Knox shouted. The garden was rushing toward us at a terrifying speed. The plants in the garden reached up with spiky branches, and a long vine uncoiled from them one of the palace's towers and whipped at us furiously. Look out, I screamed, but the vine lashed out across Mombi's arm before she could move, leaving a broad, ugly gash. She yelped in pain and let go of me. I felt my other hand slipping out of Gert's grasp. The plants are attacking, Glamora shrieked. They're defending the palace. Amy, Knox yelled frantically on Mombi's other side. The vine wrapped around Gert's legs and yanked her away from me. Glamora cried out as I plummeted toward the waiting thorns. Just as I was about to slam into the ground, a huge gust of air picked me up and sent me spinning gently. Knox, I thought, struggling to get my bearings. Knox had saved me. Gert sent a blast of fire at the vine still tangled around her legs, serving in, servering it in midair, and it reared back as she crumpled to the ground. I ran over to her. I'm fine, she gasped. No time. You must hurry. On the ground, the ticking noise was even louder and more in insistent. It felt like it was trying to crawl inside my head, and I had to resist the impulse to cover my ears. Soldiers, Knox yelled. 
I reached for my knife and whirled into a battle crouch. My reflexes were back, and none too soon. These soldiers were different from the ones who attacked us back in the Woodman's Palace. They were entirely mechanical, whirring and buzzing like a clockwork army. Some of them stood on two legs and looked almost human. Others had wheels, or tons of jo jointed legs like a centipede. Some carried weapons and metal claws, and others had swords and spears embedded in their tin torsos. Knox flicked in and out of sight, teleporting himself back and forth between the soldiers as he hacked at them with his knife. A terrifying howl split the air, and I saw a line of three-headed miniature clockwork totos descending on us from the direction of the palace. Their eyes glowed with an eerie red light that reminded me of Dorothy's shoes. Each head jaws bristled with dripping, serrated fangs as long as my forearm, and the mechanical dogs. Tails were edged with jagged steel plates that they whipped back and forth. I readied myself to fight. A fireball sailed over my head and landed among the tin soldiers, sending several of them flying. Glamora leapt to my side. "'We'll hold them off,' she yelled, sending another spray of flame into the oncoming army. "'You and Knox find Dorothy.' I ducked a stray blow and came out swinging, cutting a soldier in half on my upswing. "'How will we get to the palace?' "'Knox can take you to the palace. We can only hold them for so long. You have to move to, you have to move as fast as you can. Behind her, Mombi threw a fireball, and after fireball, into Dorothy's clockwork army. Though each one landed, there were always more soldiers to rush in and fill the gap she made. Knox was moving so fast behind me, he was just a dark blur. Gert's face was pale, but she was hovering over the battlefield, lashing out with a glowing blue whip she fastened out of magic. I couldn't just leave them out here to die. No thinking, Glamora yelled. Just go. I knew she was right. This might be our last chance. If I couldn't kill Dorothy now, this was it. The witches couldn't last long out here. I grabbed Knox's hand. Dorothy's shoes blazed my, to life at my feet, and I felt the answering stir of Oz's magic. Not yet, I told it. I squeezed my eyes shut. When I opened them, Knox and I were standing inside Dorothy's banquet hall, although it was ruined almost beyond recognition. With furniture, what furniture was left was splintered and broken. The windows were shattered, letting more of the snowy vines creep in, and the mossy green slime covered the walls. The carpet squelched underfoot. I didn't want to know what it was soaked with. Inside the palace, the ticking was so powerful that the walls shivered with each stroke. It was like standing right next to a speaker at a concert. I could feel the noise like a physical force moving through me. Knox squeezed my hand, and we raced through the palace, follow following the sound of the clock. As loud as it was, it was still stronger than in some directions than others. But the farther we went, the more the palace twisted and turned. New corridors sprang up in front of us, and then when we turned around, the hallways we'd just been running down had been replaced by stone walls. I hadn't spent enough time in the Emerald Palace to memorize its layout, but even I could tell that this was like a funhouse mirror version of the real thing, all nightmarish hallways and unexpected turns. Sometimes a hallway seemed familiar, and then I realized we'd already gone down it. The palace is leading us in circles, Knox said behind me. We have to figure something out. Keep running, I argued, tugging him down another hall. We ran through a doorway into a huge room I didn't recognize. A wooden door slammed me shut behind us. The room was a perfect circle, studded with identical doors every few feet. The ticking of the great clock thundered through the chamber. Knox tried every one of the doors in turn, but they were all locked. The Emerald Palace had sent us to a dead end. You're right, I said. The palace is moving against us. It was time to use magic. Don't let go of me, I told Knox. He nodded and tightened his grip on my hand. I closed my eyes, sending feelers of magic out through the palace. The more I tuned into my magical senses, the more I could f see and feel the rats running through the palace cellars, the whirring and clicking, clinking of the soldiers as they battled the witches outside, the few remaining living inhabitants of the palace creeping in terror through the halls and hiding in forget forgotten rooms. The evil in the palace was so strong it made my skin itch, as though the millions ant a million ants were crawling all over me. I steeled myself and kept looking, and then I found felt her, a malevolent mass at the heart of the palace, like a fattened spider at the center of its web. I shuddered involuntary. Knox's fingers tightened through mine. Where is he? She. He panted in my ear. I knew what we had to do. This way, I said. Instead of trying to open one of the doors, I turned and led them directly into the wall. But instead of slamming into solid stone, we hit something firm but yielding. A fir At first it resisted us, as though we were walking into a wall of butter, and then dissolved. 
There was a rushing noise, and everything went dark and very, very cold. Knox was holding my hand so tight, I thought I might lose circulation in my fingers. But I was squeezing him back just as hard. Amy Gum, said a familiar voice. You found me. I had a feeling you would.